by Louise Raw, as we are on a regular Hello. basis. Hello, Louise. And you've come back in today, not on your own, so no. introduce our guest. I've got the wonderful Joy Puritz with me, who is the biographer of Dr. Joan Martin, MBE, whose life we're going to be discussing today. And whose work, not, not jo uh, Joan's, but Joy's, I have in my hand, mm -hmm. Passing the Flame, the life and work of Dr. Joan Martin. Welcome, both of you, Thank to you. BBC Thank Radio you. London. Um, I must admit, this, uh, normally with the people you're going to discuss, I sort of know a little bit about them. This lady I've never heard of at all, to my shame and chagrin. We're going to change all that. <laughs> change all that right now for you, Robert. <laughs> Tell us a bit about her. Well, what's important is that also is that we're celebrating, well, not celebrating, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the worst civilian disaster um, on British soil of World War II. And it was actually Saturday, it was 75 years since the terrible disaster at the Bethnal Green Tube, the underground shelter at Bethnal Green. And that's where Joy comes in. Joy, uh, Joan, rather, I'm, I'm going to get you two confused. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm getting mixed up as well. Joan, Joan was the doctor in charge, a young doctor, 27 years old, at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Children's Hospital in Hackney on that night, that absolutely terrible night. So what happened on that night? It was 1943. The shelter, the Bethnal Green Shelter, which is the junction of Roman Road and Cambridge Heath Road, was um, an underground station. But the underground station, I think, Joy hadn't been completed then, had no, it? No, the central line stopped at Liverpool Street, and so the tunnels were empty, and they could use them for the bunks and things like that, yeah. So it was perfect for a shelter. And it had saved a lot of lives during the Blitz earlier. But on this night, it's just the most awful combination of circumstances, isn't it, Joy? Yes, you could just yes. never yeah. imagine coming together at this one time and, 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 and losing, causing the loss of so many lives. Because there'd been the heaviest Allied bombing, I think the heaviest, of Berlin, or certainly an incredibly heavy one, on the 1st of March. The people in what the year East are we in? 43, 43. Okay. 1943. So this is after the Blitz? This yes, is not yes, exactly. Exactly. yes. And exactly. a lot of children to come back. Right, okay. Which is another of the yeah. awful right. circumstances that leads to this disaster. You've got more people, more children in London because they've come back after the Blitz. Because of this bombing, which is being written about extensively in the papers, the people of the East End are understandably waiting for retaliation. So they're expecting retaliatory raids from the Nazis. So on this night, the um, 3rd of March, in the evening, people had already gone into this shelter. Before the air raid siren sounded, they'd already gone into the shelter and decided to spend the night there. And we think there are about 500 people. No, 5,000. All, all because the there? capacity was 10,000, you see, wow. and about 5,000 routine people who went mm. there every day, they were already in there. Yeah, 5,000, good wow. grief. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. just such incredible numbers. And there are more people making their way there. And then at 8.17pm, the, the air raid sirens sound, and so of course more people grab their bedding, grab essentials, and start making their way to the shelter. And then at 8.27, the most appalling piece of tragic bad luck that you just couldn't have predicted, an anti-aircraft rocket salvo was discharged, I think it was in Victoria, Victoria Park, Park, in Victoria Park, away, yes. so it's, ve it's very nearby. This was a new weapon, you see, so nobody in the area had heard this being discharged before, and it was terrifyingly loud, it was rockets, it was launching yeah. rockets. Understandably, people thought they were under attack. They thought this was an air raid starting. And so because of that, it's really important to stipulate people did not panic. It's not that people in the shelter or entering the shelter were at fault, but obviously they speeded up the process of trying to get into the shelter. And if you look online at photographs of the staircase that was then there, you can imagine the scene. The steps are very rough. There are handrails down both sides, but there's none in the middle. It's quite poorly lit. And the air raid wardens, unfortunately, are not at the top of the stairs at this point where they needed to be. So you've got people desperate to get inside, hearing this awful racket going on and thinking it's bombs coming for them. And then the, another piece of extraordinary bad luck, one woman about three stairs from the bottom tripped she was apparently either carrying a child or leading a child and she fell just at the wrong moment, just before 
the um, the rocket salvo. And this led to people just falling in waves, just awful, awful, terrifying for them. And it said that within about 30 seconds, the staircase became a charnel house. Just awful. Yeah, 300 bodies. Yeah. Six deep. Yeah. And 10 feet wide. Can you imagine? Just all on top of each other. And, and yeah. I... You know, 300 bodies yeah. lying. Yeah, they didn't die of course dead. all of them, no. but those, that was the That's number of people. That's how many people are yeah. crammed on top of yep. each other. And if you yep. look at this little dark staircase, it's not a large area at all. So just horrendous. Um, one woman who survived, Babette Clark, talked about that, and she said, I was holding someone's hand, someone fell on the back of me. She was obviously a young girl at the time. Someone was trying to drag me out. I remember my sister saying, don't pull me, I've got my little sister. Then finally an air raid warden got us out. I remember the crying and the screaming and the heat of the bodies. It was just horrible. Just imagine how horrific the, the situation was down there. And in the end, 173 people died wow. at Bethnal Green. 84 were women and 62 were children. Children, blimey. So meanwhile, Joan Martin is on duty as I said, her first job, she's a junior doctor, she's at the Queen Elizabeth's Children's Hospital, and the phone rings at 8.45, and they're told to expect 30 faints, people who fainted, at a tube station. And Joan thought to herself, well, that's just an astonishing number of people, we, we've never had anything like that before, and she thought to herself, I bet it's a test. I bet they're just testing us to see how quickly we can get ready in case there is a disaster, little did she know. And then, unfortunately, as they were running around trying to um, take down cots and put up beds and get ready, and she's working with two medical students, and you can imagine everyone running around trying to get prepared for these fainted victims. And she said, we'd hardly finished changing the beds before the first wet mauve body was carried in to the hospital. Wet, I think, because they were trying to revive people by throwing water on them, and mauve from, from suffocation, quite simply. And it must have been the most incredible shock. And then, as the night went on, body after body, um, until 11 o'clock that night, and mostly women and children, some survivors, but largely they're dealing with the dead and trying to work out where to put bodies in a casualty, a children's casualty department, just absolutely unprecedented. Now, Joy, you've written about the fact that Joan, unexpectedly, as a 27-year-old junior, found herself in charge that night. And how did that happen? Well, she did have a senior casualty officer with her, who was also a woman. But when Joan realised that there were too many bodies to be accommodated on all the beds, she got the, the two male medical students to uh, lay the bodies in the, the consulting rooms on the floor. And the senior uh, um, casualty officer said this is you can't do that it's disrespectful of the dead and she got quite hysterical you know and Joan realized that she wasn't fit to work in the state she was in so she said she suggested that she should go off duty well this was the other lady yes and can you imagine a junior doctor telling a senior what to do I mean in those days it was amazing but that's just the sort of plucky person Joan was you know and she was good at organizing things and so she managed to get rid of her and she and the two medical students were then stuck all night doing coping on their own until eight o'clock in the morning and it was such an unprecedented disaster. I was really struck by Joan saying that even the ambulance officers, the ambulance men I think they largely were on this night, were usually calm, very cheerful, that sort of blitz spirit that you would expect. But on this occasion they weren't, were they? Yes, and you know why? Because they were probably mostly local men. They would have known the people involved. Yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah. Their families might have gone to the tube shelter, you see. And so they were desperately wanting their stretchers and blankets back as soon as possible so they could get back to the scene and carry on helping, you know. What was her background? Where was she from? Well, she was from South London. She was born in, um, in West Norwood. Right. And, um, but because her father was a Methodist, Minister, they had to move every three, three years, you see, that was the rule. Right. And so she lived in all sorts of places, Huddersfield and, and Yorkshire and, and, and sometimes in Essex and, no, I mean, all over the place. Um, her favourite place was a boarding school in um, Yorkshire. Uh, when, that was when she was a, a young teenager, she loved it there and that's where she became a girl guide as well. Which was Which very, was important, very in important in her life, yes. But she was clearly early on, she was determined she was going to become a doctor, which wasn't the most usual career. Yes, and do you know why? Days. Yeah, Tell because why. she lost three friends um, 
as a child to illness and she she said to her father I don't want to have friends anymore they just die on me and so her father said well what are you going to do about it and that sowed the seed you see of, of the idea of becoming a doctor and she got more and more determined to do it yeah. Was it still relatively unusual for women to be doctors back then? Yes, it was. I mean, the only medical school in London at the time that took women was the Royal Free, which is where she got a place. Right. Yep. That's the one place that you could train. So yeah. she's at the very centre of this awful maelstrom that's happening yes. in Bethany Green. Yes, and, and waiting all through the night. And she said herself, she kept waiting for a consultant to come. She kept waiting desperately for someone to take over. And she said, I realised no one was going to come. Presumably they had heard that everybody was already dead. I'd only been qualified for one year, and here I was in charge of this desperately impossible situation. Very amazingly stoic um, woman, but you can't come through something like that unscathed. It would be inhuman, just impossible. And what made it more difficult was when they came off duty at 8am, having worked right through that appalling night, they were told not to breathe a word, weren't they? Joy of what yes, that's happened, right. what they'd seen. Yeah. She did ring her parents that morning to say she'd had a terrible night with many casualties, but that she was all right. But she didn't say anything else. She assumed, actually, that they would hear about it through, on the radio or something. But then, of course, when she was told she mustn't say anything, um, she didn't. And, you know, her parents died without her ever knowing. Wow. Without them ever knowing that she'd been involved at all. She'd never told her parents. Wow. Well. Yeah. Just incredible. Uh, when did the story come out? Because it's not the kind of story, it's so many people dead in one area, it, it must have been common knowledge among well, the people. Well, I can tell you that um, in the national papers there were very small um, articles about the accident, giving the number of dead and saying it was in a crush trying to get into a tube shelter, but it never told them where it was. They didn't. They didn't put that, and it was always a very small item, you know, they didn't make a big thing about it. They were worried about the enemy, you know, using it. And Lord Lord Hall. Yeah, and okay. Lord Hall. Okay. In fact, he did find out about it and said something, some snide remark at some stage, and really nasty. Of course, it was for morale, and uh, the reasons are understandable, but you can appreciate the effect that it has on you, not just going through something like that as a young woman, but not being able to talk about it as well. And Joy had nightmares to the end Joan. of her life. Joan. Joan. Oh, I knew I'd do this. I knew I'd do this. Joan had nightmares, didn't she, Joy, for yeah, the rest she of did. her life? Yeah, especially if something triggered them, like being interviewed, which um, didn't happen really until about 10 or 15 years ago when the media started realizing what had happened and getting interested and she found that after an interview that night she would always get her recurring nightmares of being in a crush and suffocating so what happened to her after that night she just carry on with her doctoring career? oh yes yes she just carried on she was a stoic you know well she did she had the most incredible life really she was incredibly involved with guiding as we said, and she actually, what did she add to the guiding curriculum, if you can call it that? <laughs> ah, well, before? yes, now she became guide training advisor for England, or of England, and and she was terribly keen on, on doing some of the, the activities that the scouts were allowed to do, and she thought, why can't girls do that as well, because she did it. I mean, she used to go potholing and caving, and so she, she introduced that as well, and then and things like making rope bridges over ravines and things, you know, and girls getting not girls to go days. across these rope bridges. And she found it exhilarating doing it herself. And she thought, well, I'm not going to stop the girl guys from having this excitement. Why should the boys have it, you know? <laughs> and also... <laughs> Did she stay in London? Did she stay in the East End? Or? Well, th she started um, being a girl guide at school, but then when she came to London to finish her schooling as a 16, 17 year old, so that she could then go to med school, she um, became um, the, the leader of the first Paddington, right. um, which was fairly local to where she was, you see. And even at 16, she was taking um, girl guides away for the weekend into the country, underprivileged children who'd never been in the country. I mean, nowadays, they'd never allow a 16-year-old to be in charge, would they? What about later in her career? Did she, did she, was she a GP or did she stay in the... Ah, well, she, because she wanted to do the guiding and wanted to be free at weekends and very often in the evenings, she um, worked in a clinic in North Kensington for disabled children and wow. she specialised in that. Um, 
and she and she also did home visits in North Kensington to uh, disabled children, and that meant that it freed up enough time to do these other things. Um, how long did she live? Till she was 102. No, we've only just lost her. Wow, yeah. she died on the 15th of January. Wow, so you must have got to know her. Yes, I did. Yes. Um, I mean, I started, I, I've known her for about 20 years as an acquaintance, and then in the last 10 or 15 years, I've got to know her as a friend because um, I started visiting her reg regularly, and, and she started telling me about her life, and I said, my goodness, you've got to write this down, you know. And she said, oh, well, everybody says that. <laughs> and then a few days later, I suggested that maybe I could write it down for her, and, and she thought about it for a few days, and then she said yes. Well, I'm very glad you yes. have. <laughs> the book is called Passing the Flame, The Life and Work of Dr. Joan Martin, and it's by Joy Puritz. And we've been hearing about her, or both of those ladies, along with Louise Rule. Thank you both Thank very, you. very much. Thank you.